Chess Bulletin. The Salvation Army says millions of Australians struggle with poverty. Hillsong hits the top of the charts again. And would you rather be microchipped than use a credit card? Just for the record, this is In Focus Christian News and Current Affairs. Hello, it's fantastic to have you with us this week. I'm your host, Kent Kingston. And at the news desk is the ever so poised, ever so professional, Sabelle Coutte. How are you, Sabelle? Poised and professional, of course. Well, of course. And yourself? Well, I'd like to say uh, blessed, confessed and well-dressed. <laughs> <laughs> but enough about me. Uh, we've got a great program coming up for you today. James Stanish will wade into another religious freedom hot topic. And speaking of hot topics, our family life educator, Trafford Fisher, is going to talk about men and violence. What is the go with that? And David Trim is back to talk about lies, lies and more statistics. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, he's going to be talking with scrupulous honesty about church statistics and the stories they tell us. Sounds great. News time? Or yours, Sabelle. Thanks, Kent. A new report from the Salvation Army suggests that as many as two and a half million Australians are living below the poverty line. A survey of 2,400 Salvos clients found that on average they had $18 to live on per week once accommodation expenses were paid for. The Salvation Army says this level of persistent disadvantage traps people in a cycle of poverty that's difficult to escape from. Part of the solution, they say, is for governments to invest more in poverty alleviation programs, as well as raising welfare payments that have not kept pace with inflation for several years. The Salvation Army's Red Shield Appeal is an attempt to provide assistance for hundreds of thousands of people who seek their help every year. As federal politicians continue tough negotiations over plans to reduce Australians' carbon emissions, religious leaders say there's a moral imperative to take strong action on the issue. In open letters to the Prime Minister and opposition leader, the Australian religious response to climate change challenged the nation's leaders to consider a 40% reduction in the 1990 level of carbon emissions by 2025. The Interfaith Coalition includes religious leaders from the Catholic, Anglican and Uniting Churches, as well as from Jewish, Hindu and Buddhist traditions. The letters say that despite their differing beliefs, they find common moral and religious reasons to move more strongly on reducing carbon pollution levels. In what's becoming a predictable achievement, worship band Hillsong United has once again topped Australia's album charts. According to themusic.com.au, Hillsong United's new album Empires edged out Daniel Johns, Eurovision and the Pitch Perfect 2 soundtrack to top the ARIA album charts. According to America's Billboard magazine, Empires is also headed for a top 10 spot on its album charts, the second Hillsong United album to do so. It's well known that a healthy lifestyle can reduce the risk of cancer. But what if you do all the right things and still get cancer anyway? Well, according to an article published by Cancer Research UK, evidence is emerging that people diagnosed with bowel cancer may have a better chance of surviving if they've had a healthy lifestyle up until then. The strongest indicators of surviving bowel cancer among 3,000 or so men and women involved in a large European study was a healthy weight and high consumption of plant foods. It's never too little too late. It's obviously much better if you've been on the healthy lifestyle all along. But there is a growing body of evidence from the EPIC study, um, from Dean Ornish's research into prostate cancer, showing that changing to a healthy lifestyle can make a significant difference. If you ask the average primary school student which foods they don't like, chances are they'll name vegetables. But a new healthy eating program in New Zealand is encouraging kids to eat those words. The Eat Your Words nutrition sessions have helped students in seven Kiwi primary schools to become familiar with vegetables, fruits, legumes, grains, nuts and seeds. 
A part of the strategy is the finding that once kids have been involved in preparing a particular dish, they're much more likely to eat it. The next challenge is to get the message and the recipes home to mum and dad. The Eat Your Words program is an initiative of the Sanitarium Nutrition Service, which is owned and operated by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Christian television is making its way to some of the remotest corners of the globe, connecting with people who might never otherwise get the chance to hear the gospel. In the South Pacific region, the Hope Channel network is expanding, with a deal being signed in Tonga for Christian programming to be broadcast free-to-air via Digicel's new digital platform. On the even smaller islands of Tokelau, one local council has agreed to allow Hope Channel broadcasts in its territory. And the Adventist Church, which operates Hope Channel, has been able to purchase a small TV station on Norfolk Island, off the coast of New South Wales. Plans and negotiations are also underway to bring Hope Channel free to air to the much larger viewing audiences of Australia, New Zealand and Papua New Guinea. A Christian ministry in Palestine is offering a radical reinterpretation of Israel's identity that they hope may lead to the reconciliation of Jews and Palestinians. American missionary Reverend Terry McIntosh says DNA research from the Hebrew University reveals that the majority of Palestinians are descended from the remnant of the ten lost tribes of Israel rather than from Philistines or Arabs. In that case, he says, Palestinians should be claiming Israel as their divine inheritance alongside the Jews. Some Palestinians, both Muslim and Christian, have embraced the idea but Israel's Deputy Foreign Minister has rejected the suggestion of a reunited 12 tribes. A number of workers at a high-tech office block in Sweden have taken up the offer to have a microchip implanted in their hand that they can use instead of an access card. According to the UK's Telegraph newspaper, the chip, which is about the size of a grain of rice, allows staff to swipe through doors, access the photocopier and purchase items at the workplace canteen. Australian Christian commentator Mal Fletcher says a recent study by the Visa Company found that 25% of Australians were at least slightly interested in the convenience of a chip implant when making their purchases. For some Christians, these kinds of technologies have always echoed Revelation 13's description of a mark on the hand or forehead that allows people to buy or sell. But is it a fair point to make or just paranoia? I, I think it's always smart and wise to keep our eye on what's happening around the world today. But more importantly, what does this book, the Bible, say? Does it square with what Scripture says, and Scripture says in the end of time, the mark is taken by people who refuse to give allegiance to God by the keeping of his commandments. In 2004, the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Boston in the United States was struggling with finances and decided to close 70 parishes. But the remnants of the congregation of St. Francis Xavier Cabrini Church refused to leave, and now, more than a decade later, they're still there. The protesters have maintained their 24-hour vigil at the church the entire time. Some are more than 80 years old. I'm going to lay on the floor. They're going to have to carry me out. Late last month, a Massachusetts judge ordered the protesters out with a week's notice. But the vigil has continued while the parishioners explore their legal options. And that's it for this week's news. What do you think of that, Kent? 11 years. I'll tell you what, Sabelle, it's very impressive. You know, when it comes to, you know, vigils and vows of poverty and perpetual adoration and all that sort of thing, it's pretty hard to beat the discipline of a good Catholic. Yeah, they don't muck around, do they? They definitely don't. <laughs> hey, stay with us. I'll be back in a moment with the rigorously disciplined James Standish. Planning your future can be a daunting task. What you want to do, who you want to be, and the road ahead can often be unpredictable. No one really knows what the future holds. That's just part of what makes it all so amazing. And that's why a great education matters. Because it doesn't just help you get a great job. It helps you prepare for what life can throw at you and live a great life. Avondale, it's education designed for life. 
Hi, welcome back. Well, it's great to have James Standish here, our um, resident uh, human rights lawyer and religious freedom guy. Now, James, they say if you want to know what's important to someone, or to a country, I guess, you follow the money. And this sort of relates to what's happening in the U.S. right now. Yeah, it is. Yeah, the Bible puts it this way. The, the love of money is the root of all evil. It's the root of... All kinds uh, of evil. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, all kinds. All, uh, yeah. You know, you have uh, uh, slavery uh, sure. was, a, uh, was a trade that was done... Uh, not because people love slavery, but Was, because they want money. Is. Well, is, that, 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 that's bigger very, now than ever, sadly. Very good point. I was yeah. thinking about the transatlantic slave trade, but you're right, they're yeah, still yeah. going on. In the U.S., uh, just recently, the Senate passed a, a, a bill mm -hmm. that tied trade with religious freedom. Okay. What the uh, the bill does essentially is say that as the U.S. Uh, negotiates trade pacts, they have to consider the religious freedom record of the country that they're engaging in negotiations with. Okay. Yeah. So, 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 so this is basically, it can be used as a, a bit of a carrot stick approach. Well, that's exactly so, right. Listen, if your country X, if you don't sort out your religious freedom record, we are we're perhaps not going to participate in trade with you as maybe enthusiastically as we that's might That's right, and, and we may yeah. not reduce the tariffs and all the things that go on in these, sure. in these trade, uh, okay. trade negotiations. Now, interestingly, uh, the House hasn't passed this bill. There's okay. a lot of questions of whether that's going to happen. In mm -hmm. fact, there's probably a pretty high likelihood mm. that they won't. Mm. But they might. Who knows? I mean, this, the, the politics of the U.S. aside, I mean, this, this is a larger issue, isn't it, really? It is. And I think the conversation seems to be going in the other way a lot of the time, that the conversation I hear between Australia and China, for example, when we're discussing China in this country, China has human rights issues, we know that. Mm -hmm. um, but the argument is, but if we continue to trade with them, we can build a positive relationship. Mm -hmm. And perhaps on that basis, they'll listen to us when we talk about human rights improvements. Yeah. Well, I've got a problem with that argument generally. And, and that is, uh, the problem is, is this. Countries' human rights records mm -hmm. uh, and the way they approach human rights has very little to do with uh, engaging in trade. I'll give you a good example. We mm -hmm. said, well, look, China's going to have to get on the internet. And so, of course, everything's going to change. No. In China, the internet is thoroughly censored. In fact, yeah. information technology has been used to repress people, and even U.S. firms mm. have been coerced into participating with that, giving information about individuals, mm. and those individuals subsequently being arrested and prosecuted. So it is not necessarily the case. And, and, mm. and more importantly, when we build up an economy, we are giving that economy power, and trade is a way that we build up economies. Mm. If we think about the most problematic uh, societies vis-a-vis -vis human rights in history, mm. it's not the countries that have dysfunctional uh, economies like the Soviet Union did. Mm. In fact, communism was a, uh, a as bad of a system as that was mm. because their economic system was so messed up, it limited their ability to actually uh, execute fully their, their, okay. their vision. The Nazis, on the other hand, used free trade capitalism. It was Mercedes, it was BMW. Hugo Boss, mm. the designer, designed the SS uniforms. That's why mm. they look so great. Yeah. And that's why it's so dangerous mm. to have free trade and then build up an economy with no uh, with no consideration of what well, the human rights consequences you've, you've, are. You've, you've used a couple, couple of very emotive examples sure. there. I mean, I, th I think you're probably missing the fact that um, Germany was pushed under by a lot of very, ha a very harsh reparations regime. Sure, sure. And uh, what about South Africa? Surely the yeah. economic sanctions there had, had, had something that, that, to do that, with, that, that, with, with shutting that regime absolutely down. Absolutely did. And that's my point. Mm. In South Africa, we took a, well, obviously a relatively small country in, in, compared to China or one of these other large. Sure. But but we said, okay, you've got a problem there. We won't trade with you. And guess what? Things change. It worked. It worked. Mm. Now, in, it doesn't in, always work. In, in Cuba, less so, you'd it, have to yeah, say. But it did limit Cuba's ability to export mm. the corrosive ideology that was running them. And, and so, yes, there's limits to what you can do with trade, uh, with trade to uh, negotiations. But human rights should always be on the table. Because as soon as you take that off, mm. guess what? you're empowering the oppression of other people. Mm. And as some people seem to forget too easily these days, religious freedom is part of that human rights package. Oh, you bet. It's, yeah. a, it's our first human right. Never forget it. <laughs> well, hey, thanks for your time today, James. It's a pleasure. We'll take a break now, and I'll be back straight after that with Family in Focus. 
travel back in time to ancient civilizations through this bi-monthly magazine, Archaeological Diggings. This month, Diggings goes inside the amazing burial mound at Amphipolis in Greece, a site to rival the tomb of King Tut. But who is buried there? We look at the claim that Jesus' bodily remains have been unearthed, along with those of his family. And we also bring you the latest news from the fascinating world of archaeology. Don't miss an issue. Subscribe online or ask for archaeological diggings at your local newsagent. Hi, welcome back. Well, I have our family life educator Trafford Fisher here with us. How are you, Trafford? Very well. And very good. Trafford, today we have a very serious topic to talk mm. about, and, and that's family violence. And perhaps mm -hmm. the maybe the hidden side of family violence we don't hear much about. In, in Australia, I think we're doing some good things mm. about violence. We have a variety of, of social groups, political groups who are saying, hey, we need to look at this whole violence issue, and particularly, mm. of course, violence against women. Yeah, sure. And we rightfully, desperately have to get a handle on that and really do some, you know, sustain the energy on, on mm. keeping that at the forefront. What we might be tempted to forget is that men also are victims of abuse and violence. Really? And in, yeah, and at from a recent, what from, like, from oh, street violence, pub violence, or are you still talking about that? I'm talking about home, home violence. In fact, one in three. Let me. Can I show you this statistics yeah, yeah. recently from uh, the Australian Bureau of Statistics, 2012-13? They found that one in three victims of current partner violence during the last 12 months and since the age of 15 were male. So it's wow. one in three. One in three victims of emotional abuse by a partner and since the age of 15 were male. One in three victims of stalking, male. One in three victims of physical violence by a boyfriend or girlfriend, male. Hmm. One in three victims of sexual assault during the last 12 months, male. Wow. I was surprised by this. Yeah, yeah. One in three victims of physical and or sexual abuse before the age of 15 were male. It, it, it's all there and all the usual measures of domestic violence, you know, physical, sexual, um, emotional, emotional yeah, yeah. spiritual, um, they're all acted out against and men. all represented there and all this represented. is hugely political though Trafford and, and of course it, you know you don't want to start the battle of the statistics you know what no. exactly are you measuring there one-off incidents or a sustained exactly. pattern of abuse and subjugation I mean yeah. how yeah. do we measure all yeah have we got all the measurements right but you're right what it what it does remind us is that this is a shared journey mm. that if we just emphasize one against the other well I think we're missing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what it did say, men were less than half as likely as women to have told anybody about partner violence, to have sought advice or support, mm -hmm. or to have contacted the police. Mm -hmm. so, so what it's well, highlighted- the services just aren't there, are they, for, for men seeking not help in, in that situation? They're limited. Yeah. They're limited. Can I share with you a, a just, female- Just quickly. Yeah, a female Melbourne psychologist said, a man's health is wrapped in his identity. Mm -hmm. So I think a man is is- are going to be a little bit shy about, I'm going to report that I'm being beaten up by my wife. Well, what sort of man are you? This mm. sense of, you know, a man's well, got to be able to... It's comedy know. for a lot of people. They, yes. they can be, it's hilarious. So. so where do men turn? They don't want to turn. They're reluctant to turn. So they are vulnerable. And we as men are vulnerable here mm. in this regard. So I think we need to continue the battle. We need to continue the, 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 mm. the fight we've taken up of highlighting the significance of, 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 of violence across the family mm. spectrum, even in for all the its kids, forms. in all its forms. Wow. We need to keep this alive, take care of each other. The mm. whole Christian message, love one another. It's mm. vital yeah. that we get that right. Wow, it's a real challenge. Thanks yeah, for that, Trafford. Thank you, Kim. We'll be back straight after the break. Unearth ancient civilizations with archeological diggings. This bi-monthly magazine will keep you up to date with news and insights from the fascinating world of archaeology. Subscribe online or ask for archaeological diggings at your newsagent. Hi, welcome back. And it's a pleasure to have here in the studio from the General Conference Headquarters, the headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the US, Dr. David Trim. How are you, David? I'm good, Ken. I'm glad to be with you. Now, you're with the Office of Archives and Statistics. Did I get that right? Archive statistics and research, but and, so and almost research. there. Yes. So you're, you're stuck down there in the basement with lots of shelves and dusty boxes full of paper. That, that's sort of how I imagine it. Am I you, far off? You're close, uh, except these days increasingly we also have lots of computers because we digitize mm. documents and then make them available, uh, some of them available on the internet for, uh, for anyone to research. 
uh, and the statistics likewise. Mm. If anyone is interested in statistics of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, for example, mm-hmm. they can go to www.adventiststatistics.org, O-R-G, and you can find everything you want to know now or for the past 150 years. Well, there you go. If you're having trouble getting to sleep, there's... Um... <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> It would help with that, I imagine. (laughs) It would help. Now, they do say lies, lies, and more statistics, don't they? Uh, Lies, damn lies, and then statistics uh, are even worse. uh, uh, Disraeli said it probably in the 1860s, so it's been true for an awfully long time. (laughs) There you go. So when we look at, I mean, Christianity, it's the world's largest religion. It is. by, By far, it is growing. But what do statistics tell us about the nature of that growth? You know, that's a good question, Kent, partly because uh, statistics, they are, they are problematic. Uh, and so, for example, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has gone traditionally to great lengths to collect accurate statistics. But it turns out that in some parts of the world, we've been very good at adding and not at subtracting mm-hmm. people who've left. And so we've had to work on that. Some churches, some denominations are very good at record keeping on statistics. Others, basically, once you're baptized, they claim you forever, even if you never mm-hmm. go as an adult or join another church. And when it comes to other religions, it's, 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 we use, there's census data from various countries. There's estimates. So, I mean, we're not talking at um, incredible details of precision. But when it comes to, say, orders of magnitude, yes, we can speak with some confidence. And even though Islam gets an awful lot of press, and even though most of India is one over one billion population of Hindus, mm. Christianity is the world's largest religion, and that isn't going to change. The evidence shows that, in fact, Christianity is growing at such a rate. Islam or Hinduism are not going to take it over anytime soon. Oh, okay, because I'd heard that the rate of growth in other religions was actually faster than the greater growth of Christianity. Rate of uh, it depends which form of Christianity too. There's okay. you know different forms and different they grow at different rates. But Christianity overall is growing faster than Islam around the world. Again, bearing in mind the sort of caveats that I gave about you know mm, but, mm. but in terms of the broad trends, the broad trends are clear. Um, but that isn't to say that Christianity is growing everywhere. Yeah, well, and that that comes to my next question, really. So, where is Christianity, you know, going great guns, and where is it struggling? Christianity is immensely strong in Latin America and sub-Saharan Africa. Okay. So that's Africa, not North Africa, which is heavily Islamic, and Christianity is an endangered species. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in uh, the areas sort of around West Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, uh, all the way across through to East Africa, and then down to mm-hmm. the Cape of Good Hope. Uh, Christianity is flourishing there. Islam is there. What what, what sociologists of religion call African traditional religions yes. are there. So an- um, animism, ancestor worship. Exactly. Yeah. Witchcraft. Yeah. Uh, these are powerful things. But Christianity is growing phenomenally there and also in Latin America. Hmm. Now, it is interesting, Kent. Brazil is starting to feel the effects of postmodernism. Okay. Historically, it had always been, you know, this is a, a tr- very uh, Christian area. Mm. But at the moment, uh, church leaders of different faiths in Brazil are noticing that they're being impacted by postmodern trends from Europe and America. But I have to tell you, having visited there recently, uh, their postmodernism is of a different type of postmodernism to say to the, the, the mm. Urbanized post Christian West. When, when you say post modernism, do you mean statistics are showing there is more atheism, more, more agnostic um, no. people and this in is, there? No, this is the not? interesting thing. Atheism is flourishing nowhere. Okay. Atheism does not flourish. Um, agnosticism, or people who say this is the classic response. I'm spiritual, but not religious. Mm. People who say I, I'm, I'm drawn to a, you know, spirituality. I believe there's a God, but I will declare myself having an affinity with no religion. Mm. Those are what's on the rise in the Western world. And so, for example, uh, the, there was a recent opinion poll by the Pew Center, which is a major, very reliable polling center in the United States. Mm. And it summarized its results on religion w- with the heading, The Rise of the Nuns. Mm. And we're not thinking here of women in, uh, in white headdresses, but <laughs> yeah. none, people who say, which religion do, uh, do you uh, declare an affinity with? None of the above. No religion. Yeah. yeah. But that doesn't mean to say they're atheists. So atheism is not growing. Most people still feel a call towards the spiritual, towards God, Mm. but they don't want to declare an affinity with a particular religion. That's the story in North America, Mm. Western Europe, Australasia, and increasingly parts of South Africa and Brazil. Do you have any idea why that is? Why are people saying, yes, I'm a spiritual person, but institutional religion just turns me off? It's... 
there's a lot of reasons for that, but you know, a lot of it comes down to suspicion of religion and mm. the view which you hear time and time again, it's often about Christianity, but mm. you know, religion is oppressive, it is repressive, uh, it is all about power, it is not transparent, mm. um, it puts down women, it puts down gays, it puts down, you know, insert here. Mm. Um, and we have to be honest and say there's an historical background to that and there is some truth behind it, though it also misses the wider point about the real character of Christianity. Mm -hmm. But still, you know, in some parts of the world, Christianity is growing and flourishing. But, you know, if we look at missiologists coined this expression, the 1040 window. Yes. Yeah. For a part of the world um, between the 10th and 40th parallels. So this is just above the equator to to fairly high up or? Yeah, from just, yeah. exactly. And all the way from China. From over China across to, to Europe. To the Middle East. Yeah, to the yeah. Middle East. Yeah. And well across to West Africa. And it creates this kind of window on the world. Mm. This is the area of the great world religions. Mm. Islam, Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, and also the Chinese communist version of Confucianism and Taoism. Mm. The, which rival Christianity, this is an area with many governments that don't allow for religious freedom. Mm -hmm. And this is also an area that includes some extraordinarily rich countries, but some ones with desperate mm. poverty. So for all of these reasons, Christianity is deeply challenged there to spread. And Christianity is a minority religion in, in, in all of those. Okay. Just, to, just quickly as we finish, David, because we are nearly out of time. We talked about Latin America and, and sub-Saharan Africa, how the church is growing very fast there. Are there tips we can take from those areas that we can apply in, in the 1040 window or, or in the postmodern West? The 1040 window has its own challenges, but in the postmodern West, yes, it is that witnessing to Jesus is not something done by professionals, by the pastor. The ordinary member in the pew can't just leave it to the pastor and say it's his job, mm. it's our job as well. Because there's not a pastor half the time in some of those countries. And that's the reason they're growing. People take responsibility, and I would say our church members need to do that as well. Wow, time to step up. Hey, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Ken. We'll take a short break now. See you after the break. Planning your future can be a daunting task. What you want to do, who you want to be, and the road ahead can often be unpredictable. No one really knows what the future holds. Avondale, it's education designed for life. Well, Kent, as usual, it's been an informative and thought-provoking episode of In Focus. Well, we aim to please, Sabelle. <laughs> now, if you'd like to comment on anything you see on In Focus, please don't hesitate to send us a note via email, Facebook or Twitter. The details are right there on your screen. And of course, all the Record In Focus videos are available at our website to watch and share. Visit us anytime at record.net.au. Oh, please do. Thanks for your company this week. We'll see you next time on Record In Focus. God bless. Thank you.